he went over a little bit over my part. I am supposed to introduce the lecture lecturer tonight. So, uh, but I have a, a nice pace of uh, introduction to the speaker tonight. So I will basically go over, if you don't mind. And Son Su Young is, as was mentioned, assistant professor of Cornell University. She is one of the notable young scholars in the field of history of book and print culture in early modern East Asia. Her first book, Writing for Print, uh, just came out last March from Harvard University Press. It examines the ways in which print changed the production, circulation, and reception of the literary text in China and Korea in the 17th and 18th centuries. She has also published several articles about Chinese and Korean print culture, focusing on the transmission of Chinese novels and his stories to Joseon Korea in the prominent journals. She has received her BA and MA from Yonsei University here in Seoul and PhD from the University of Chicago with distinction distinction. She received the postdoctoral fellowship from Stanford University, and after working as an assistant professor at the University of Colorado Boulder, she is currently teaching in the East Asian Department uh, at Cornell University. She is a recipient of the several distinguished awards, such as the Academic, Academy of Korean Studies Fellowship, Social Science Research Council Research Fellowship, and Peking University Harvard Yanqing Fellowship. She was also invited to give a talks at the numerous institutions, including the University of Pennsylvania, the University of British Columbia, the University of Washington, Princeton University, Penn State, the University of Wisconsin, the University of Toronto, Harvard University, and Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. She is currently working on Seoul family of Tai Song and examines how the members of this distinguished family of the 18th century accumulated books and objects from China and reorganized the information and knowledge in the light of print culture, com uh, com com commercialization, and urbanization in late Joseph. I want to uh, I want to omit her title because Dr. Shin already mentioned. Uh, please welcome me in. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Shin Su Young from Cornell University. Thank you so much for the generous introduction, and I'm I'm really grateful for all of you for taking time to come to listen to my lecture. And also, I'm really, really honored and pleased to have an opportunity to speak to you tonight about the topic of my research. As Professor Ong just introduced, I consider myself as a book historian in East Asia. And one of the main concerns for the book historians is to examine the relationship between book and society. And today, I'd like to raise a question called, did printing technology change chosen society? That the question that I often received from my students and colleagues and re-examine the relationship between the print technology and then society through the case studies of chosen Korea. The invention of printing technology has been considered one of the most important innovations in human history. It is believed that print's capability to produce identical multiple copies enabled an unprecedented number of books to circulate widely across regional and social boundaries. The impact of print technology was so profound that scholars such as Elizabeth Eisenstein have labeled the advent of that technology as the printing revolution. Since the invention of mechanical movable type printing by Johannes Gutenberg in 1436, the multiplication of identical copies brought about textual fixity, standardization, and wide dissemination of knowledge and information. This swept away traditional manuscript culture 
and open up an era of mass communication in which the spread of relatively unrestricted information and revolutionary ideas played a crucial role in the dissolving of the Latin Christendom of Europe and propelled that world toward modernity. In other words, print is considered one of the main agents of the social transformation over the past 500 years. The attention to the so-called printing revolution in Western Europe has often led to the question as to why East Asia did not experience a printing revolution comparable to Europe's, although movable type printing had been invented in China as early as the 11th century and had evolved to be in widespread use in Korea. In fact, East Asia was the scene of a flourishing print culture much earlier than the Gutenberg's invention. For example, the Italian trader Marco Polo, who visited Mongol China and left a record of his travel to China. Actually, this, his travel record became an instant bestseller in the 14th century Europe and initiated the great interest in and fantasies about the Far East. He was so amazed by the great efficiency of printing and brought the knowledge of woodblock printing with him when he returned from China. The renowned Jesuit, printing, uh, renowned Jesuit missionary of Ming China, Matteo Rich, praised the highly developed printing technology, exclaiming that the simplicity of Chinese printing is what accounts for the exceedingly large number of books in circulation here and the ridiculously low prices at which they are sold. What is striking is that East Asia, including China, Japan, and Korea, had a thriving print culture by the 13th century at the latest, thanks to woodblock, not movable type printing. This historical fact, despite the invention of movable type, woodblock print continued to predominate East Asia before the 20th century, requires us to question the assumption that movable type printing was the most advanced printing technology and any society which encountered it could not help embracing it. In East Asia, however, movable type printing offered less advantages over woodblock printing. Given that the Chinese language, which was used as a common written medium in East Asia, doesn't use an alphabetic script, a huge quantity of pieces of type, usually 100,000 characters or more, was needed in movable type printing. So, in comparison to the movable type printing, woodblock printing required the relatively low, capital, low level of capital investment. In addition, the carved printing blocks represented a lasting capital asset. They could be reused, sold, and recarved for a new book. Moreover, Woodblock printing allowed for far more flexibility and many visual possibilities in the layout and presentation of each page than the typography, including punctuations, glosses, head, head notes, commentary, illustrations, etc. In this respect, movable type printing was not necessarily faster, easier, and more economical means in East Asia. Instead, Woodblock printing was a much more effective choice in reproducing writings and circulating the books. In effect, the widespread use of woodblock printing was able to cause the tremendous impact on the production and distribution of books, as much as movable type printing did in Renaissance Europe. It reminds us of that of emphasis on the printing revolution that is only concerned with technological invention itself fails to notice that the movable type printing was in itself not a sign of social advance or of modernity. Instead of discussing who invented what technology first, we should take a close look at the ways how the technology was evolved in close interaction with East Asian social, economic, and political realities. That is, the question that I initially posed as the title of this talk whether printing technology changed chosen society or not, might not be the right question to ask, since it is premised on the idea that Joseon did not see a printing revolution similar to what occurred in Europe. Instead, the more important questions that we should address are how print technology was advanced in Joseon Korea 
for what purposes it was employed, and what the development of print technology tells us about the change of chosen society. So in the following, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about the plurality of the printing technologies in Joseon, Korea in three different categories. The first one is official printing, and second one is private printing, and the third one is commercial printing. And then also, I really wanted to emphasize the inseparable relationship of the development of print technology in Joseon, Korea with the East, uh, expansion of print culture in East Asia overall. What is noteworthy about Joseon Korea is that it developed a variety of printing technologies such as metal movable type printing, wood block printing, and wooden movable type printing for different purposes and occasions. As is well known, Korea developed highly advanced printing technology earlier than any other country in the world. The world's early stated woodblock printing text, a copy of the Buddhist Dharani Sutra called Sutra of the Dharani of Pure and Solid Light, was found inside the pagoda in the Bulguksa Temple in Gyeongju. It was estimated to be printed around 8750. Moreover, Korea also has the oldest extant metal movable type printed text, a copy of the Buddhist sutra called Anthology of the Writings of the Monk Begun, Begun Hwasang Chorok Bulcho Chikji Simche Yojal. It was printed in 1377, which reveals that the Korea pioneered metal movable type printing. It is officially acknowledged as world heritage and then registered to the UNESCO's memory of the world. The Goryeo Dynasty Tripitika, known as the Tripitika Koreana, Goryeo Dejanggyeong, is another Korean imprint that has been added to the UNESCO's Memory of the World Register. It is a Korean collection of Buddhist scriptures printed in the 13th century, which is preserved to this day in the Hainsa Temple in southern Korea. Carved on more than 80,000 wooden printing blocks in an appeal to the authority of the Buddha in the defense of Korea Korea against the Mongol invasions, it embodies the best printing and publishing techniques of the period. Each block was meticulously prepared and beautifully inscribed with a great degree of regularity. Thus it is known as the most accurate edition of Tripitika written in classical Chinese. Since it became a standard critical edition for East Asian Buddhism, a scholarship, it has been widely distributed over the centuries. In particular, the blocks have been shown to be extremely durable, as even now they print crisp, complete copies of the Buddhist canons 760 years after their creation. This is partly owing to the buildings constructed to house the woodblocks called Depositories for the Tripitika Korean Woodblocks called Changgyeong Panjan, built in the 15th century. The buildings, designed to protect the woodblocks from deterioration by providing the proper temperature, humidity, and ventilation. They are made of salt that combine charcoal, powdered lime, and salt to withstand different climatic conditions thereby preserving the wood box from rodent and insect infestation. This building was also registered as a UNESCO memory of the world even earlier than the Tripitika Korean itself. Because of this earlier achievement, the Joseon dynasty was well positioned to advance the development of printing technology. In particular, the Joseon kings had a great interest in the metal movable type printing. In contrast to the Goryeo dynasty in which printing was used for mass production of the Buddhist canons, the Joseon kings attempt to employ the metal move of printing to establish their newly founded dynasty's authority by producing royally sanctioned Confucian classics and texts. And then it was a totally understandable move in the sense that Goryeo adopted Buddhism as a state religion, whereas Joseon made Confucianism as, a state, as the state orthodoxy to make, it, make itself distinguished from the previous Goryeo dynasty. The Joseon dynasty's metal movable type printing, unlike the metal punch system thought to be used by Gutenberg, used a sand casting method, supposedly less expensive, difficult, and time-consuming. The first metal movable type was manufactured in 1403 
but the letter size and font were inconsistent, and the thickness of types was uneven. So you can totally see that the drastic difference of the okay. yeah. This one, this one was the, the printed copy, the first manufactured metal mobile type, and then you can see that the, how much it was improved around the 1434, and then actually it was happening through the several trials and then errors, and throughout the Joseon dynasty, actually Joseon court really, really engaged in renovating and then improving the metal movable type. And in total, 17 different sets of metal movable type were cast. Although the number of copies produced by metal movable type printing was between 30 and 100 on average, it was sometimes possible to print a very large quantity. For example, a collection of scholars writing called Golyunji was printed in 1725 with the metal movable type. It consisted of 20 volumes, 735 sheets in total. According to archival record, the government printed 400 copies of the book over the course of 90 days. This means that the metal movable type printing produced 3,267 sheets per day. Since metal mobile type printing required money and labor on a massive scale, only the government could engage in it. The Joseon court manufactured 100,000 to 300,000 metal mobile type on average. It had the notable advantage that once the types were created and the printing of a book was finished, the types were easily rearranged and made ready to print another book. And since the type was made of metal, such as copper, lead, and iron, it was durable. For these reasons, metal mobile type printing was optimized for the production of a large number of titles of books in small quantities. Thus, it was used to authorize certain standard texts by the government. However, once the state-sanctioned texts text were created with the metal mobile type, the Joseon court used woodblock printing for their dissemination due to the woodblock print's capability for large print runs at low cost. In short, the Joseon dynasty maintained a dual structure of official printing. The court will first issue a work by means of metal mobile type through the Central Bureau of Printing in the capital, and then this printed copy would be reproduced in a woodblock facsimile by local offices for nationwide distribution. This is a really uh, very clear example to show that the replicate the exact identical copy of the metal movable type. So the two book looks really identical, including the book titles and then the times of the year that the copy was made. Only the difference is these four characters. And then here it clearly indicates this copy was printed by movable type in the Central Bureau of Printing in Capital. And this one was the facsimile reproduced copy by the woodblock print in the local office of Chunju. And then the color is just sort of slightly different because the late uh, the modern library actually inserted a gossamer type of the page to protect the cover page for this court royally sanctioned printed text. But except that these two copies look exactly identical. So it might be really interesting and an also effective way to produce the, 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 the books uh, in official versions using both by metal mobile type and woodblock print. Although the dual structure of official printing provided the officials and elites with a stable supply of books, Private publishing also flourished in meeting the increasing demands of the ritual. Printing was usually done by Buddhist temples, local schools, private academies, lineages, and individual families by means of woodblock print. The process of woodblock printing itself was relatively simple. After the wood, usually juice, pear, and white birch, had been cured, a copy of the text was pasted based on, on a flat wooden block, and that the wood around the text was cut away to leave the text of standing in relief. In order to print, it is necessary to ink the block, place a sheet of paper over it, and rub the paper to ensure the transfer of the ink to the paper and set it aside to dry. 
leaving a mirror image of the text. In theory, anyone could publish a book as long as he had a capital for wood, paper, and ink, and for hiring carvers to make a set of printing blocks. Once the blocks are carved, woodblock prints can be reproduced until the blocks are worn out, which may not happen for several years. This meant that the woodblock print had a great advantage in the printing of copies in any demanded amount as and when necessary. The woodblock imprints predominated East Asia prior to the 20th century, but there were regional differences in the physical aspects of woodblock imprints that make them easy to distinguish even without opening them. One of the distinctive characteristics of a Korean printed book was the diverse book cover illustration. The Korean imprints usually had yellow covers made of a wide variety of elaborated illustrations, a choice that was far less common in China and Japan. And then why the color was yellow? Because it was dyed by the, the, the dyeing from gardenia trees, and then it kind of protected the printed copies from the uh, yeah, book-eaten worms and the insects. This book co these book cover illustrations was usually done in woodblock called in Nunghwapan to reflect individual owner's taste. And the second one is that Korean imprints has five holes for the thread sun binding, where Chinese and Japanese books usually have four. This is very practical to, to tip to distinguish the Korean copies from the, the copies from different regions of East Asia. And the part of the reason why they needed five hole binding is that usually the size of the book are larger and bigger than the ones produced in China and Japan. And then they really wanted to make sure that the, to bond the a large number of the painted sheets together by the five pore binding. Thirdly, Korean woodblocks had handles called maguri. And then yeah, this one on each hand. They were attached not only for ease of printing, but also kept the carved characters from damage by keeping some distance between blocks and allowing air to flow. In addition, they also prevented a slab of block from being caught by distributing its weight evenly. Chinese wood blocks rarely have this type of a handle partly because they had no need to store the blocks for a long time. In general, wood blocks in China were recycled as soon as the initial printing was done and the surfaces of the blocks were shaved off and recarved multiple times. But the recycling of wood blocks was not as common in Korea. The blocks were not considered merely a means to disseminate books, being also regarded a symbol of the glory and legacy of the family members or teachers. After the initial printing, blocks were not just planed down for reuse on another project, but were mostly preserved. By materializing the trace of the author on the blocks, woodblock printing was perceived to ensure the survival and preservation of the writings of the figure whose name deserved to be commemorated and immortalized. So when you visit a kind of really big mansion by the Joseon elite, and then you often find a building called Changpango like this. And then this pavilion was designed to, to store and then preserve the wood blocks. And then this is really interesting and also very valuable resources for the uh, modern book historians to recover all the blocks and then they can reproduce the copy from the blocks, the, from the blocks that the original copy was made. While it is true that woodblock printing was much cheaper than metal movable type printing, the carving of woodblocks still needed a considerable sum of money and labor. So for example, this literary collection was printed in 17 volumes from 1889 to 1891, and the cost of carving 632 blocks was 8,500 yang. And then yang is the old currency of Joseon Korea. And then this 8,500 yang included payment for the wood to make the blocks, and then transportation, 
and third, to cure the blocks, and then tools for printing and then carving, and the labor such as printers and the carvers and the transporters, and the food to feed these labor forces, etc. Considering the price of a cow at the time was around 51 yen, the cost for printing the book was equivalent to the price of 117 cows, approximately 850 million won at the present time. Its budget was beyond what one family could afford. In fact, the funds were collected by 208 families of the riders' lineage of 24 villages and scores of individual contributors. Thus, only families with status and power could launch private publishing projects, opening collaboration with local offices, schools, or lineages. In short, Woodblock printing during the Joseon dynasty was not only perceived a means of the wide dissemination of text, but also served as a marker of social standing and cultural power. And then this is why in a later period, the emerging middle class called Junin competitively printed their family members' writings in Woodblocks to verify their rising status and newly accumulated wealth. Since making wood blocks was such a symbolic and costly enterprise, wooden movable type emerged as an alternative beginning in the 16th century. Compared to metal movable type, wooden movable type was less durable, but it required much less in terms of resources. This kind of printing was also much less time and labor intensive than wood block printing because the wooden movable type was made easily, and then could be rearranged to produce other titles of books quickly. Thus, an individual, if he wanted to do printing by himself in the Joseon period, he had two options. If there were ample resources, and then a large quantity of, a large number of copies was needed, and then the demand was expected to be prolonged, woodblock printing was preferred. But if the budget was tight, or if the distribution was expected, to be limited, wooden movable type was a viable choice. The Ritorati in Joseon used wooden movable type much more frequently than in any other East Asian country. The quality of the book made by wooden movable type was usually inferior compared to the metal movable type and well-made woodblock print. But, yes. But this book, this was made and then printed by privately, um, privately manufactured wooden movable type by one of the uh, high officials and then prime ministers of Nam Gong Chol. And then this book actually shows that one of the highest qualities that the wooden movable type printing could achieve. And then you can totally see that the, the beauty and then also the clarity of the characters inscribed here. In the 19th century, Wooden movable type became so widespread that itinerant printers emerged and they carried wooden movable types and set the blocks on demand. It remained popular into the 1920s when modern lithography introduced from the West swept the market. In this respect, while metal movable type printing was monopolized by the government, Wooden movable type was developed as a more accessible means for the people to satisfy their individual needs for making books. The development of commercial publishing in Joseon Korea was not as dynamic as in China and Japan. This was partly because the printing activities of both government agencies and Buddhist temples were so extensive as to leave real room for the development of an independent publishing market, but also because of the much tighter control of the circulation of books in Korea. There were several discussions about establishing state-run bookstores after the 16th century, but it was not until the 19th century that books became widely available for sale and the commercial bookshops flourished. They said, after the Hideyoshi invasion in the late 16th century open called as Imjinweran, several forms of commercial distributors did appear, one being the book broker. Book brokers made house calls in the areas of the capital where officials and scholars and writers gathered to supply the buyers with books. 
And there are actually not much record about the activities of book brokers left, but there is actually one famous one, and then his name is called Zhou Xinsen. And then Xinsen is not even his given name, I guess, because Xinsen is just a meaning that the immortal means kind of a superhuman being. Because he was described by several literati of the time that he was going everywhere, through markets, alleys, and public offices, and meeting everyone, irrespectively of rank or age, in order to sell books. He was particularly known for the, his extensive knowledge of books and for having memorized the name of the author and the number of volumes of each book, as if he were an erudite scholar himself. In addition, a number of commercial book lenders emerged in the 18th century in the Seoul area. And then this is the old map of Seoul. And then you can see that these are the red dots. Oof. Yeah. Red dots indicate the identified location of the book lending stores uh, that have been known so far. And then see how much spread uh, they are, uh, how much they were spread in over Seoul, Korea. And then be careful that this is actually not the Han River here. And then Han River is here because the southern part of the Han River, which is called Gangnam these days, one of the flourishing commercial the district in Seoul area, even was not the part of the official Seoul domain in the chosen Korea. So you can see that the, from the just a small domain of the northern part of the Han River, actually commercial book lending libraries are pretty much spread and then flourished at the time. The books circulated by these commercial book lenders were mostly transcribed copies. And it often had some scribbles from the readers. And then there are some doodles. He might be really bored, and he really wanted to yeah, paint a boy here. And there is even a note to the owner of the copy. And then he said, see, the owner, and then this book was not legible, and then it really hinders the, the pleasure and the convenience of reading, so you please have a better copy than that. The most popular items were translations of imported Chinese vernacular novels and the full-length vernacular Korean novels that told of heroic stories and war and the trials and tribulations of marriage and family relationships. The customers were from all social classes, from the high officials and elites to commoners, merchants, soldiers, and debased people. But the women of the gentry, who possessed both money and time, emerged as the main customers. The popularity of reading novels among the female members of the gentry class was so widespread that it caused concern among the male elites. The renowned scholar official of the 18th century, Yi dong -mo, Although he was a fervent supporter of women's education, but he sighed that some women waste so much money on renting the novels that they squander the family fortune. And lastly, from the end of the 18th century on, commercial publishers and sellers were active. They mainly produced the cheap and low quality books by woodblock printing. The major center of commercial publishing was the Seoul area, and then this was actually a painting of an imagined reconstruction of the market in the Seoul. And then you can, the, in the middle of the building, you can see that the bookshop here. And then this is the extent, uh, expected version of the bookshops. The best, uh, uh, and then not only in Seoul, and then there are also other centers like the Jeonju and then Anseong, with each putting its regional stamp on their publications in terms of theme and content. And then this copy is clearly indicated it is from the Anseong, because in the last part, and then it said, the printer's coupon said that this is the printed copy from the Anseong. The best-selling book items were children's primers, examination literature for the civil service examinations, almanacs, daily encyclopedias, practical books on agriculture and medicine, leather manuals, poetry collections, and novels. Most novels in commercial book market were written in Korean alphabet called Hangul, revealing that the main customers for these were the commoners and women who used Korean script as the main written medium 
instead of literary Chinese, the prestigious language of official and intellectual discourse. The development of print technology and the flourishing print culture was not limited by national boundaries. In fact, Joseon's print culture was an integral part of the overall expansion of print culture in early modern East Asia through the large international flow of books, usually from China to Korea, from China to Korea to Japan, or from China to Japan. What is interesting is that this centrifugal flow of books is no sign of active cultural imperialism from China because the spread of Chinese books was not forced upon by China but initiated by its neighboring countries for their own needs. The active book trade between Mingqing China, Joseon Korea, and Edo Tokugawa Japan not only established diverse venues of communication but also contributed to the vitality of the cosmopolitan culture thriving in the early modern science sphere via the active exchange of books and knowledge. Importation of books from China. The transmission of books between China and Korea had been going on since the 11th century, but the book trade reached its peak in the 17th and 18th centuries through the tribute trade. The tributary relationship between China and Korea obliged Korea to send tribute missions to Beijing one to four times a year, and these official visits provided the legitimate opportunities for trade. Korean missions brought goods such as ginseng, paper, hemp, and horses, and traded them for silk, medicine, and luxury goods. Books were especially sought after by the Koreans. Those sent on a trade mission were officially instructed to purchase Chinese books that the Joseon court requested, but official interpreters immersed as major book traders since they not only had an understanding of Chinese language, but also claimed profits from their official rights to trade. Envoys of the mission also bought the books for themselves and their friends. One renowned scholar novelist, Hogan, for instance, brought back about 4,000 books from China. During the missions, Korean envoys frequently visited Liu Lichang, the newly emergent center of the book market in Beijing, where books produced all over China were gathered. Because the Jews and envoys tend to purchase a large number of books at a time, the bookshops in Liu Lichang customarily prepared for the arrival of chosen missions by stocking up in advance and placing advertisement in the front of the bookshops. The Korean envoys which not only made them friends with the bookstore owners, but also established relationships with Qing intellectuals who happened to shop for books in Liu Lichang. This context helped shape and maintain the transnational intellectual community in the 18th and 19th centuries, as envoys and Qing intellectuals exchanged letters and books even after the chosen envoys returned to Korea. Aside from perennially imported items such as the Confucian classics and histories, 18th century chosen readers had access to an unprecedented range of books through the book trade, including novels, dramas, miscellanies, and private literary collections. The emerging bibliophiles in the 18th century, usually the science of distinguished elite families in the Seoul area, collected volumes in the tens of thousands. And the scholar in the Seoul area had access to four to 500 Chinese books on average. Among the flourishing urban elites, the reading of Chinese books became a popular hobby to show off their refined cultural taste and financial means. The boom in the reading of Chinese books was so widespread that it even caused the King Zhengzhou to ban the importation of books from China temporarily in order to prevent the spread of allegedly heterodox ideas they conveyed. This demonstrates that the thriving transnational transmission of books challenges the state monopoly on the production and circulation of books and instead carved out an avenue of unofficial and private communication among Joseon elites. Transmission of books to Japan. Although Korean books imported into Japan on a much smaller scale than were Chinese books, the Korean books exerted a deep influence. 
in early years, the Buddhist canon printed in Korea attracted a great deal of interest in Japan. Due to their interest in Buddhism, the Japanese had continuously requested copies of Tripitaka Koreana beginning in 1389. According to the historical record, the Japanese government officially requested a copy of Tripitaka Koreana 87 times, and the Korean court granted this request 45 times. Following the resumption of friendly relations in the early 17th century after the Hideyoshi invasion, a more diverse range of books in Korea were imported into Japan. The Seo family of daimyo on the island of Tsushima put together a catalog of the daimyo's library in 1683, which shows that the collection contained a considerable number of 17th century books printed in Korea, including the major annotations of Confucian classics by Korean scholars and the classic of Korean medicine, Treasured Mirror of Eastern Medicine. They seem to have been flowed to Japan through two channels, the first being the missions from Joseon Korea to Japan. A total of 60 missions were sent, and on each trip, Korean envoys and Japanese intellectuals engaged in intellectual dialogues via brush talk because they shared the written common written medium, literary Chinese, and they engaged in the exchange of books. The second channel was through the Japan house called Wegan, the outpost established in Busan. In this limited area, the official trade between the daimyo of Tsushima, representing the king of Japan, and the Korean government was conducted. The profit was the trade was considerable, and as many as 1,000 Japanese resided in the area. Tsushima's chief export was silver, while the imports from Korea were raw silk, ginseng, and books. Chinese books also reached Japan through the Korean peninsula. The transmission of books did not necessarily fit the vertical model of diffusion from China to Korea to Japan, however. And then this is actually one of the interesting case because uh, this is a really famous uh, collection of the fantastic tales called New Tales for the Tree Lamp Week. And then it was almost forgotten in China itself as soon as it came out in the 16th century. But when it was transmitted to Korea, it gained a lot of popularity. <coughs> and then one of the Korean scholars actually made an adapted version of his narrative called Kumoshina. And also two Korean scholars added commentaries and then also annotations to the original copy of the Chinese text. And then Japan also got the edition through the Korea but yeah, the original copy of the Chinese text itself was not that popular. And instead, the Korean version of adaptation of the, this Chinese collection was much more popular. And then the annotations by, to the original copy of the Chinese text by two Korean scholars exerted a deep influence. And then it gave rise to a number of sequels, adaptations, and imitations. So basically, the transmission of books and then the flow of books itself is pretty much complicated. Another rare and interesting example is that the, the one of the epitome of the Korean uh, the accumulation of Korean medical knowledge called Treasured Mirror of Eastern Medicine, Dongi Bogam. And when it was first printed in the 16th century in Joseon, and then it immediately transmitted to Japan and then also China. And Japan, in Japan, it gained really, really, really big popularity and then influence. And then they reprinted this copy of the book in so many different editions. And this edition was transmitted to uh, China through the Chinese book merchant who engaged in the book trade between Nagasaki area and then the Jiangnan, the southern part of the Yangtze area, the center of the culture and the trade at the time. So the, the transmission of books and then also the flow of the text itself actually shows that the, how the records adapted and then received differently uh, in, different, uh, in, the, in the same text and then also show that the, how the flow of the printed copy of the book was so active in this period. In conclusion, the development of print technology and print culture in Joseon Korea reveals how the different forms of print technology successfully fulfill the diverse needs of society. The state dominated the development of metal and movable type for the purpose of creating state-sanctioned editions. 
While woodblock printing was employed for wide dissemination of authorized knowledge by the state, the elites engaged in woodblock printing to valorize their social, economic, and cultural status. Wooden movable type printing was widely utilized for less costly and fast reproduction of copies of books. The commoners and women who were excluded from the least monopoly of cultural capital carved out their own cultural space through consumption of the transcribed manuscripts and cheap woodblock imprints made available by commercial printing. Instead of simply being a means of wide dissemination, therefore, print technology was reinterpreted by different social groups to serve a great variety of purposes. In other words, the appropriation of print technology in Joseon Korea disproves the idea that print had a universal monolithic effect. On the contrary, the uses of this technology reflected the increasingly diversifying demands for books on the part of different social groups and their competition to take control of the circulation of information and knowledge amid the changing social, economic, and political conditions of Joseon society. In addition, the use of print of Joseon Korea shows that print technology and the expansion of print culture were far from being restricted by national border as it grew out of the complex interactions with other countries. Although movable type was first invented in China in the 11th century, its technology became practically usable thanks to Joseon Korea's invention of metal movable type and continuous innovations because the original movable type invented in China used baked clay movable type and then it was definitely not practical. But while Joseon Korea successfully developed its own metal movable type, it constantly sought information about modeled after the method and typeface of Chinese imprint. And the books imported from China that not only circulated widely in Korea, but also often flowed to Japan, promoted the cultural and social needs for conversations between the contemporary intellectuals in Sinosphere, which shared a common linguistic and textual heritage. Refusing to be confined within a single culture, print did not stop at the national borders, but both facilitated and was facilitated by the constant interactions between different cultures in East Asia. Thank you.